Thank you for downloading this Real Agriculture podcast. Next thing you know, you know the next thing. Next is Now is a short podcast discussing agriculture's emerging next-gen tech and trends as they're happening in our industry. Next is Now, presented by GFL Ag. Listen where you get your podcasts today. Good day and welcome to Wheat Pete's Word here on Real Agriculture for Wednesday, March the 13th. On this episode of The Word, oh my gosh, it's early start to the year, no doubt about that. So early that Harvest 24 is already done. Can you believe that? I also needs to talk about stripper headers briefly, particularly for the Western people that listen to the podcast. But wow, some really interesting stuff there. Nitrogen, phosphorus, tons of questions coming in there. Try to finish up on that and whatever other uh, agronomic questions that I can get to before I once again run out of time. Let's go! Yes, it is incredibly warm this winter, and that's awesome because the wheat looks phenomenal. So many people saying, gosh, the wheat looks good, Peter. And we need to talk about nitrogen management because of that, and we'll get to that. But yes, the wheat looks great, but all these warm temperatures, that means, man, if you are not out there early with your taps into the maple trees in southwestern Ontario in many places maple syrup harvest is done we're over she's just the maple buds have come out already and so that maple syrup harvest is complete in southwestern Ontario not true further north interestingly enough and good for the, the maple syrup producers further north we're going back to more seasonable temperatures it looks like in the 14 day forecast by the way March 13 where I'm standing here in Ingersoll. It is currently 13 degrees Celsius, going to a high of 17 degrees Celsius. Gosh, that is definitely warm for the middle of March. We are going back, though, to more seasonable temperatures, and it's probably a good thing. What we don't want to happen is all those fruit trees to get too far advanced, and then we get that cold May frost or late April frost when they're in bloom. That's all bad from a, from a cropping standpoint. As we move further south, it's not just Ontario that's been warm. Missouri, Iowa, the early indicators in that area would suggest that they are 20 plus days early, and that's, that's a big impact in terms of how the crops are developing down there, but also in terms of migratory insect pests that we might get here. So a great article by Anthony Hansen out of Minnesota talking about cold temperatures and insect survival. And just a few quick notes. We'll, we'll link that post, uh, that blog in the post here. But the, from an insect standpoint, we, we just have not killed any soybean aphids here in, in the province at all. Soybean aphids have not been a big issue in much of the province, but there's always hot spots, or there's often hot spots, and some areas tend to get them more consistently than others. Certainly, eastern Ontario has been more of a hot spot more frequently, and you just go, oh, okay that we got to scout for those soybean aphids. In fact, in central Ontario a few years ago, we actually had really high numbers when the soybeans in late June before they even started to flower and just go, wow, okay, there's something we have to pay attention to. Alfalfa weevil is another pest that we probably haven't thinned out the alfalfa weevil population very much. So for the hay growers listening, we're going to have to scout when we get, you know, that, that foot high alfalfa because they could be early. We're we're going to have to get out there and watch for that. For you continuous corn growers, and I just shake my head and say, why do you grow continuous corn? Because we know we're developing corn rootworm resistance, but gosh, again, we just haven't slowed many of those down, and so corn rootworm could be a much bigger issue if you're growing continuous corn. I know that there are some new traits, the RNAi trait that is out there, but the answer is that 
that the corn rootworm overcomes that particular trait quite quickly and use the genetic, res the genetic uh, tools in the toolbox for sure. But the easiest answer is just rotate and you wouldn't have that problem and we would not have to worry about them developing resistance to those uh, genetic tools. So it's not just those pests, it's also the migratory pests. If it's been 20 days early in Missouri and Iowa, Boy, things like potato leafhopper, uh, cutworm, any of the pests, armyworm, that move up from the south and get blown into Ontario or into Western Canada, Quebec, the Maritimes, whatever, they could be earlier. So uh, it's not an alert, 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 but it is a heads up that I think we have to pay attention from an insect standpoint. Enough on that, let's move on. So I was, I was in Idaho last week, I spoke on Friday, and just a great grower there out of Colorado, Justin Luton. And 23 years now, he has used stripper headers to combine his wheat and his barley and a number of other crops. It doesn't work for all crops, but he said, when it comes to wheat, 23 years, he's run stripper headers. He's only ever combined 40 acres with a draper head. And he, the... I know it's not a big thing in most of Western Canada, in most of the, the uh, Midwest U.S., where the North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, stripper headers are not a big deal. In Colorado, they're a big deal. In Kansas, they're getting to be a big deal. And I really think growers need to look at them more. And I know many producers have kind of pushed back and said, oh, they're heavy, they're hard to run. So with you get an increase in combine capacity, but what's really interesting about these stripper headers is that even in lodged wheat, you think, oh, lodged wheat, I can't pick it up. They create such a vacuum. So Justin went into wheat that was lodged from a wheat stem sawfly. So Western growers know what that's like. It's flat on the ground. It's impossible to pick up. The stripper header creates such a vacuum that once you get it close to the ground at the start and you pick that crop up, it just sucks the crop up. And actually, after they harvested 95% of that lodged crop. And after they went through, the wheat was standing much better than before they started. And you can combine both ways. You don't have to do it one way once you get onto that. So uh, to me, that's phenomenal. Remember that with a stripper header, almost all the separation happens at the header. And so one of the challenges with that is to keep the grain in the header and get it into the cylinder. And so you actually see grains spitting out the front of it. And Justin thinks that's why a lot of growers don't go to a stripper header because you can see the odd kernel fly out the front of the header and you say, oh, I'm losing grain. And Justin can set those headers to a two-tenths of a bushel per acre field loss. And he says with your, with your typical draper header, the odd head gets knocked off onto the ground, but you don't see it because it doesn't spit out forward and that your actual losses are probably quite a bit less with the stripper header than with a standard header. It's just that it's more visible. So we think that's a bad thing, but there was a whole bunch of other cool things. The biggest one, the absolute biggest one is moisture retention. With the stripper header, now remember, Colorado, he's dry land, so that means that super low rainfall, uh, you know, somewhere some like six inches of rainfall, sometimes 14 inches if, if he's really lucky, that's what he would ex hope to get. Where other producers who are using normal production practices, what we would call normal draper header, whatever, they would be planting into dust because all of that moisture had evaporated in his stripped wheat stubble, there's so much moisture that it's almost too wet to plant. And that's the difference. And it's a 10 bushel per acre yield difference. It's just one of these things that I think uh, we have to look at more. It's super dry in some areas. Uh, Dust Bowl Cedar, so Boers and Farms in South Dakota, saying that they are planting the earliest they have ever and it's absolutely dry dust conditions. They are seeding into dust, hoping for moisture, uh, the earliest they've ever seeded the oat crop. So uh, you put all that together and you say, man, 
we have got to get better on stripper headers. And then rotation comes into play, how much residue you can leave, uh, wh how you put that together so that you actually maintain enough residue to maintain that moisture in the soil and, and stop those evaporative losses. Lots of people think that it's stubble height matters because of the amount of snow you trap. It's actually not correct. Uh, you might trap more snow, that's a good thing. But what you really do is reduce the evaporation from the soil surface. And that evaporation is what hurts you far more than not trapping the snow. And so, yeah, stripper headers, something, something Western Canadian farmers just need to look at more. And Justin did a super job on that. Okay, I want to move on and into the Ontario situation. Talk about wheat nitrogen. So lots of of discussion. Uh, we put out a video last Thursday with my thoughts about that. And in general terms, it's too early to put nitrogen on. There's a great article on field crop news that you can read as well. But remember, we're early. And if you recall an earlier podcast, Wheat Pete's Word, we talked about the Delmarva region, region, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia. They're legislated to not apply nitrogen fertilizer until March the 1st because of the nitrogen going into Chesapeake Bay and the environmental consequences that has. They were so early in their wheat crops starting to grow, their rye crops starting to grow, that they got an exemption for 2024 and they could apply on February the 15th. We are essentially, I don't know, two weeks ahead of normal green up and, and that wheat starting to grow. You can dig up the wheat plants. There's obviously new white root growth there. So we are growing and that means we need to just rethink a little bit that nitrogen management strategy. And so on small wheat, on that November wheat, uh, if you can get out on the frost now, that it's, it's turning colder, you get out on a frosty night and you can apply a bit of nitrogen and your sulfur, I would not go over 50 pounds of nitrogen, but in that situation to try to stimulate tillers, and it may not work if it stays cool, and we don't get the, the growthy conditions to allow tillers, you'll drive over the field and you won't see additional tillers. It doesn't always work, but I think you have to do everything you can to support that tiller uh, development if we get that option on really big wheat. So on wheat that has four or five tillers was planted in September, man, it's just too early to put on nitrogen. The chances of you really boosting much there, uh, it's just really small. So there we wait. But the majority of the wheat, like Johnson's wheat, where we're looking at kind of two tillers, one tiller per plant, so two heads per plant. Oh, we could uh, more heads would be a good thing. And trying to stimulate a bit of early growth there, I think, is not an all bad strategy. Again, the big shot of nitrogen has to go on at growth stage 30. We are not there yet. Jan asking me, is it time for manipulator yet? He's in Kent County. Not a chance, Jan. We've got a long way to go before that. But uh, I really do think that, that this nitrogen strategy on an early year, we have to look at boosting where we can boost, where it makes sense to get out there and boost. And I know a few growers, Jeremy, going out there and, and applying some nitrogen just to see how that works. Mark has done that as well. Uh, Jeremy did not put on any, any sulfur, and there's lots of pushback on Twitter about that. And Jeremy said, for goodness sakes, all I could get from the dealer was the nitrogen. I, he just didn't have the sulfur in place. So fair enough. Uh, we would, though, suggest the sulfur if you can do that. The other thing I will say, forage rye or forage triticale, man, if you are harvesting that cereal crop for forage, it's much more important to get some early nitrogen there and stimulate that early growth. Kevin's saying he applied some manure on some wheat, I believe it was in late February on some, on some colder soil, and that already the difference there in the growth, the color of the crop that he can see is phenomenal. And so from a, an absolute forage harvest standpoint, early nitrogen becomes much more important on these, on these annual forage crops. Kevin, by the way, you asked about residual for nitrogen and sulfur out of that, that hog manure on wheat. So first off, any manure on wheat, oh, Trying to get uniformity of application would drive a sane man to drink. And that's, that's the real challenge with manure. 
dairy manure, on wheat, we just don't get enough nitrogen. Full stop. There just isn't enough available nitrogen. So if you're going to put dairy manure on wheat, you must add some commercial fertilizer. With hog manure, a nice article by Glenn Arnold out of Ohio State, the Ohio State University, where he suggested for most finishing hog manures, 4,000 gallons could, could supply all of your nitrogen demand on the wheat crop. In Shane and my trials, we never saw that, and it was a uniformity of application situation. So you try to put on not your full shot, balance it out with some nitrogen. Uh, chicken manure, uh, feather manure, that's different. You can get lots of nitrogen there. But again, it's the uniformity of application that matters. The sulfur component. There should be lots of sulfur in that manure. You should not need any commercial sulfur, but it's in the elemental form. And we did talk a little bit about this last week with um, Mike asking about it and, and Kevin, ha or pardon me, Kelvin rather, having some decent luck there. My experience in the manure world is that even with a history of repeated manure applications, the fact that it is in the elemental form we, we have twice run into significant sulfur deficiencies where there should not have been it, been any sulfur deficiency given the amount of manure. I now, for all my clients, I'm 10 pounds of sulfur even where there is manure there just because it's an insurance policy. We just can't get short. And hey, the other question that Jeremy got asked on, you know, on his nitrogen test on that early wheat was if he protected it, some really great data from Brandt Soil and Crop, and you have to be a Soil and Crop member to have had access to this data, but they did, they did uh, share it with me, and I just give you a quick, quick synopsis on that really early applied nitrogen, and they measured the nitrogen loss using decimeter tubes and uh, Marika Vanderland's uh, master's thesis, she figured that out, and so that's putting that, that research into practice, it's really cool. They had less than 1% loss. So they put on 100 pounds of nitrogen. They lost less than a pound. When it's early, the ground is cool. Uh, they jet, the potential for loss is simply low. The other really interesting thing in that, that data set that kind of blew me away, we always talk about how you put urea on a, the surface in a no-till situation and you run higher risk of loss because of the urease enzyme that is in the residue, and that's what drives the volatilization loss in their trials. They actually saw less loss from no-till or strip-till than they did from minimum till or conventional till. And that makes a little bit of sense because it, with the minimum till, if we have that soil moisture where that, that nitrogen is, and so the nitrogen has access to water but doesn't get rainfall to move it into the soil surface or into the soil proper, we can get more volatilization loss, no till or strip till, put it on the soil surface, lots of residue there. But if that soil surface is dry, and remember, last May was dry, 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 well, no moisture, no loss. And that's essentially what they saw in that, in that particular trial. Kind of cool stuff. Hey, lots of questions coming in as well around phosphorus and availability and sources. And, and Eric sending a, a tweet out saying, has anybody you know, tried some of these other phosphorus sources? At the end of the day, if you look at the wheat nutrient uptake data that Shane and I just released and, and working with Dr. Josh Naselski, Dr. Adrian Carendo to try and get a scientific paper out of this, gosh, imagine that, Johnson the agronomist with a scientific paper, that would be cool, but we only saw a total of 25 pounds of phosphorus uptake. And if you think about soil testing, and if you don't have a soil test yet, what a great opportunity this spring was and is to pull a soil test. But if you have a 15 part per million soil test level, well, you double that to get pounds of phosphorus that are available. It's just the way it works. Uh, parts per million, 2 million pounds in 6 inches deep of soil. So you double that. So that's 30 pounds of available phosphorus. The total uptake of the wheat crop is 25 pounds. But remember, it's 30 pounds available, but the wheat roots only explore 1% of the soil, so that's actually only 0.3 pounds that they get exposed to. If you put that phosphorus right with the wheat seed, well, guess what? 
It's almost all available in the early growing, uh, and the longer it's with the soil, the less it is available because it complexes either with calcium or with iron. But if we put 50 pounds you know, in, a, in a band right with wheat seed, and even if we get 10% of that as available to the plant, that's five pounds of available phosphorus. So it, it really makes a big difference. And some of these products talk about making that phosphorus, you know, stay available longer, but the roots are only in that zone for a certain amount of time. And, and once they get outside of that zone, well, you have to have new roots in that zone to pick up that additional phosphorus. Most of the time, if you think about spending more on phosphorus, if your base fertility is not where it should be, 25 parts per million, give or take, you're better off to try to build that base fertility so that the roots can explore better base fertility and the mycorrhizae can find that phosphorus for the plant. Uh, do the trials, absolutely. But when it comes to phosphorus, it's a complicated thing. Band it, it works better, and keep your base fertility high uh, or, or in that medium range, I should say, that's where you generally make the most money. And with that, I am out of time. That's it, that's all. On behalf of the team here at Real Agriculture, this is Wheat Pete with the word for Wednesday, March the 13th. Hey, keep the questions, the comments coming, and I hope the wheat keeps growing. Talk to you next week.